All right, another episode of the Square and Compass podcast. Back again doing longer form podcasts. It's been a little while. Uh, last time we were in Texas. This time we're sticking a little bit closer to home, closer to home with worshipful brother Ishtvin Horvat uh, in Ontario. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting. So we, I mean, I've met you a few times on a few different occasions, but um, the kind of the start or the impetus for this podcast came when we met each other in Maple Lodge, if I recall correctly, in Vaughan. We're there for an installation, and you were kind enough to give me a signed copy of your book, which I've got here, right? Weekly Masonic Doubts. Uh, you know you have a copy there as well. Um, nice enough to sign it for me, and, and I've had the chance to, to look it over. Um, and so that's kind of what we're here to talk about is, is that work. Uh, but more, you know, before you even get started with that, just how's it going? How are you doing? How are things right now? I know you're just getting off of a cold, but hope you're feeling better. Yes, I am feeling better already. Uh, unfortunately, during my travel back from Europe, I caught some bug somewhere on plane or air, airport. And it uh, bothered me for a while, but now I am on the recovery path. And uh, so hopefully... Uh, from now on, everything will be fine. You know, I, I was reading the foreword to Weekly Masonic Doubts, written by Most Worshipful Brother Cameron, um, who, you know, uh, past Grand Master. But he mentioned something, and I believe it was either in his foreword or even in your introduction. And I wanted to, to talk to you about this. You know, you, according to this book, you speak four languages. Um, yes, I've I've interviewed some brothers who speak two languages, French and English, never four. I was curious. Do you think that you know speaking four languages as a uh, as an ambulance goes passing by? Do you think that speaking four languages, being fluent in four languages, does that give you a different sense of our Masonic ritual of the words we use? Having you know, I, I'm assuming performed ritual in different languages. Does it change the way you think that you interact with or interpret the ritual? I would think it must to a certain extent. In a way, yes. Uh, now, uh, you have to know that besides being a polyglot, I mean, meaning uh, speaking more languages, I am also a linguist by trade. So I am always looking at our Masonic texts uh, ritual, uh, history, and, and lectures uh, with the eye of uh, the linguist, with the eye of a person who can relate to other rituals in other languages, where most of the time the words are not the same. The main tenets, the main ideas, the main ideals of Freemasonry might be the same, but how they are expressed, how they are presented in different cultures, in different languages, that might be significantly different. But in the same time, that uh, provides me or any other person who is looking at uh, our texts, so to speak, rituals, uh, from the perspective of different languages, from the perspective of... Uh, different uh, ways of expression, it gives a tremendous opportunity to learn and, and to widen your understanding uh, because you are not confined to the limits and the framework of one single language. So that's how I see it. And hopefully I can contribute sometimes uh, to our common Masonic lore, so to speak, uh, bringing this uh, plus, bringing this uh, different perspective of coming from a different continent, different culture, different linguistic background. You know, and even that, just as you mentioned, right, coming from a different continent, um, you being from from Transylvania, do you think that that 
in and of itself gives you a, a unique perspective on both Freemasonry in general, but also on, you know, Canadian Freemasonry, Ontario Freemasonry versus other countries? Like, does it, does it give you a, what type of perspective do you think that that gives you that maybe assists you in having a deeper understanding of, of our craft? Well, let me start with a very, very blunt uh, confession that when I arrived to Canada and I visited the first lodges around here in, in Ontario, I was utterly disappointed. Uh, I found it uh, a lot of formalism without any uh, content, uh, without any spiritual, intellectual involvement, just going through the motions, um, mechanically parroting the ritual without understanding and lacking any kind of what we would call today Masonic education. At uh, that time, uh, 20 something, almost 30 years ago, it was rare to have any kind of uh, lecture or presentation given in the lodge. Now it's happening more and more often, although not exactly as I would love to see it. But anyway, so I was coming for a more intellectual kind of uh, Freemasonry where the majority of the members were, uh, let's see, uh, uh, sociologically uh, belonging to what is called the intelligentsia, the intellectual elite of the country, so to speak. And uh, there was no meeting without, uh, and we were meeting every second week, there was no meeting without a lecture, without a presentation. We call it an architectural piece. Well, of course, except uh, when there was a degree work, but that's very rare because they are very picky over there. They don't uh, push everybody through the degrees every month. So sometimes the wait list is one or two years. And the most important part was always the lectures, the presentation of that architectural piece, and the discussions following, which was also done in a very organized uh, manner. That's part also how, how you even ask for, uh, for the floor. First, you have to present your hand, and then the one of the wardens, because the two wardens in that lodge were sitting both in the west, and depending on which side you were sitting, that warden would tell worshipful master under my column, brother so and so wants to speak, and then you get the permission to speak. So it, it was a lot of things were different. Uh, now I got accustomed to what we have here, uh, but yes, it was a constant learning process, which was also very, very challenging because not only I had to learn uh, the, a new ritual in my fourth language, Eng English is my fourth language, actually, after Hungarian, Romanian, Russian, and uh, but I also had to understand what is behind. And that's where most of the time I felt left alone out in the cold because I have met excellent ritualists that I learned how to learn and how to deliver this hour ritual, the work the, from the small black book. But uh, I didn't get much help uh, about understanding it, about uh, peeling, you know, the layers of that text and, and going back to the the initial uh, meaning. In that regard, I was left mainly on my own, but luckily my linguistic background and, and my ability to read left and right in different languages helped me to build now, by now, uh, quite a good grasp, I think, of our ritual and uh, understanding what's going on. So that's what 
happened in the past 20 something years since I am here in, in Canada. The is that a problem that you think or to what extent is is that a problem in in Masonic lodges and we'll kind of maybe focus more on Ontario for this question um, as you discussed right you said when you first came especially there was a real lack of Masonic education taking place in lodges you said that you think that it's improving since um, to what extent though to still in 2024, do you think that there's an issue with a lack of Masonic education in in lodges, um, whether it be a lack of, of Masonic education kind of from the master or, or the officers or just presentations in lodges? To what extent do you think that's still an issue in 2024 as compared to when you came to Canada and first started attending lodge? as i said it improved it improved a lot uh, yet i think that there is much to do the biggest problem probably is and it's not really related to persons or whether it be the worshipful master or whoever is in charge for the masonic education but it, it's a issue of mentality in many places, it is seen as a small checkbox so that we have to check. Somebody stands up, uh, did a Google search, found a paper, copied from the internet. He reads it in four and five minutes very fast so that we, let's go down to have a beer. And then, okay, we had Masonic education, check. Um, I don't think that's... Uh, the proper way to do it. I think, uh, and again, I have to refer back to my first two years in the craft back home in uh, in, uh, in Budapest, in Hungary. We It was mandatory to spend one year, minimum one year in a degree before being allowed to go to the next one. During that year, every uh, member, be it under the apprentice or fellow craft, had to present at least two papers during the year uh, proving the understanding of uh, that degree, uh, proving uh, his thorough uh, studying and understanding of the teachings of Freemasonry. There was no formal catechism that you have to memorize because that's not proving, that's just uh, if your memory is good, then you are good. If your memory is not good, then you are not a good mason, they say. That's a crap. I, I don't uh, sign up for, for that. That doesn't tell anything about uh, the quality of a mason because some people have a photographic memory and others are struggling to remember everything word by word. Nevertheless, they may have a deeper understanding or, and a better understanding of uh, the tenets of masonry and the philosophy of masonry and on top of that they might behave much like a mason so being a mason uh, behaving as a mason and giving an example even outside of the lodge has nothing to do with memorizing the catechism Unfortunately, we have a lot of these, uh, to say, misconceptions that, uh, another one, if I am working now on a paper, if somebody is a good ritualist, can memorize excellently and knows all the details, even the choreography, is he a good mason? Is that enough? So these are questions that we never ask or these are uncomfortable questions that should have been asked in the craft, but Canadians being nice and polite people, we don't like uncomfortable questions. <laughs> you haven't met me. I'm not always the most polite. Um, you know, but that does, well, that is, uh, how do I say it? That, I, 
that's one of those tensions, right? I think that exists in the craft now that we're seeing pop up a lot more and more, especially as more and more of podcasts and online content and books are written about Freemasonry. Right, one of those discussions you're seeing or questions being asked is, you know, what makes a good Mason? What does it mean to be a good Mason? Um, yeah, and I don't, I don't necessarily know that anybody has has an answer to it. Um, oh, I don't have answer either. I have yeah, only I don't, questions. My it, whole book is only questions. <laughs> it's definitely one of those those. I would say the 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 the, the quote unquote the questions that we're seeing now is what what makes a good mason how do you define a good mason um and i'm about to sneeze holy cow just a sec the um i'm okay and uh what makes him what makes a good mason and then the extent to which a lodge should be an esoteric versus an exoteric enterprise i think are the two main um questions being asked you know uh, and that you know, brings us more to, I think, your book. One of the fascinating things about your book is there are a ton of books, and you discuss it in your book, right? There's a lot of words written on Freemasonry. Uh, Mackie, if you want to have a pike, depending where you want to go. There aren't a lot of people asking questions about Freemasonry, right? And as you said, you know, Weekly Masonic Doubts, it's a, it's a book entirely of questions. What prompted you to take that approach? And what do you hope people, you know, Masons, especially reading it, will, will take from that approach? Well, definitely the most important uh, the, uh, motivation behind this book was that there are a lot of uh, cliches, a lot of uh, commonplaces that are repeated and thrown left and right. You know, whenever a question comes up, we, we learned a few sentences, a few phrases uh, that we repeat ad nauseum uh, whenever uh, some questions come up uh, without giving a thought, without pausing for a moment and thinking, Okay, what did I just say? Why did I say this? Do I really believe this? Uh, is there any uh, factual background to this thing, what I just said? So one of my intentions, main intentions, actually, was to, to make uh, our brothers... And together uh, with me, you know, let's take one by one these uh, cliches, these uh, phrases that we use, overuse all the time, and look at them from a different angle. Look at them from a different perspective. Uh, just trying to understand what that phrase really means and why do we say it and as you dig more into the history or the origin of such uh, sentences uh, you learn during the process and that's why my intention was to take certain truth that we accept, you know, as from time immemorial, most of the time that's not true. Uh, so certain uh, sentences, certain ideas, certain uh, urban legends that we hand over to generation by generation and take a fresh look at them. And in that regard, uh, referring back to your previous questions, in that regard, I was lucky because uh, for a long time I was an outsider here. So, yes, I was already a member of a, my stepmother lodge in, in Hamilton, so to speak, uh, the lodge that I affiliated and I am still a member of. But uh, by my basic uh, 
education, Masonic education. I, I got it in the first uh, two, three years, uh, not here. So I I was always looking through a prism, through a lens, if you want, uh, that gave um, me more question mark than assurances. So I, I started to to write about those and, and, and to start, uh, and I started to look into uh, those questions uh, from ritual to music to uh, requirements of uh, being becoming a mason and, and many other uh, things that we kind of never question. And that started to bother me that uh, we are supposed to be thinking people. Uh, we are supposed to uh, be, you know, the ones, because historically many lodges were at the forefront of, uh, you know, of philosophy, of new way of thinking, new ways of approaching uh, philosophical uh, and social uh, issues. And we kind of, in the last 100 years, we, we lost, at least that's how it seems, that we lost any curiosity to be uh, involved uh, or to, to even discuss major issues that affect uh, our lives. Uh, let me give you an example. Most of the Masonic history that you read uh, or have read they treat Freemasonry as if it exists in a vacuum. No relations to, uh, to the history that's going on around us. Uh, as if uh, we exist in a, in a, in a vid, in somewhere, you know, unrelated to everything that is going on around us. No matter that's a Second World War, no matter what's going on, you know, in the society at large, uh, we pretend that uh, we exist independent of everything, as if we have no relation to the real history and the real society in which we live. So I think that's where we lost a little bit, you know, our way, because we, we sometimes people don't even know why are we here and what are we doing one of the chapters is what is Freemasonry and what I am doing in it. So, yeah, uh, that's a question everybody should ask. Is that a failure, do you think, the, not asking those questions? Is, is that a failure, do you think, of lodge leadership, you know, masters, um, kind of even even because you can have younger masters but like the the older guard if you will um not not pushing the younger members to think about those things do you think that some fault lies with grand lodges or grand lodge for not kind of pushing these more esoteric questions um or do you think it's yeah i, I wonder how much of that is just a consequence of um of um kind of the times, you know, there's, there's, it seems as though for so many people, even I joined 2007, so I'm hardly, you know, I'm relatively young in my Masonic career, 15 years, 16 years in. Um, from when I joined to now, it seems as though the amount of work that is being placed, not not Masonic work per se, but just the amount of work that's being placed on the average member is, is the, the the amount of time they have is so much less, and there's so much more work. And also, you know, we have more administrative responsibilities now than we did in the past in terms of the type of for, even for a Masonic lodge. And I think this is a good thing. I'm not knocking it. I think it's necessary, right? But. Um, making sure that you have all of your administrative work done, your building forms completed, your insurance up. To, like, it seems as though you have an increase in administrative functions combined with brothers just being really, really busy in day-to-day -day life. It seems as though in some ways maybe 
the first victim of that has been these questions and has been taking time to maybe take a more philosophical or questioning approach to the craft. Yeah, I think it's a little bit more complicated and it has also some historical roots. Um, as we all know, the peak numbers in Freemasonry in North America, both US and Canada, were uh, in 1959 and 1960, respectively. So that was the high, the year, those were the years with the highest numbers of uh, Masons. And ever since, uh we are shrinking which i consider a good thing and i will tell you why and i will also refer to an article by our past grandmaster who wrote the foreword to, uh, for my book as well he also wrote uh, i'm just quoting the idea that uh, this huge influx of new members which happened uh, in the two decades after or the one and a half decades after the F Second World War, uh, actually it was so huge that there were not enough mentors to mentor, educate, and teach the new Masons. So basically, we inflated the numbers. It was an abnormally inflated numbers in North America, a lodges with five hundred members and and. Uh, things like that. You cannot remember 500 people, your uh, lodge members. So, but the most, the biggest problem probably was the lack of mentors, knowledgeable mentors who would have been able to teach and educate and mentor the new members. So we, we got a whole generation of, uh, uneducated masons i'm talking uh, masonically uneducated otherwise they might have been a very bright and well educated uh, members of the society but masonically their lack of knowledge was outstanding and slowly slowly that generation that came into masonry like that arrived to the top positions in the craft including grand lodge and what they did, they reproduced their ignorant selves again and again. And that's where we are now. So, unfortunately, uh, th uh, this trend wasn't, uh, how to say, stopped and wasn't uh, turned around. That lately, again, I am talking maybe about 10, last 10, 15 years, there are some timid uh, initiatives to turn around this trend and to make Freemasonry not a dining club, not a social club where you go out to drink, uh, to have a drink once a month away from your wife. Uh, as many people explained to me, that was the whole idea of uh, their membership. So, but making it a something more uh, Close, closer to the initial intent of those that started Freemasonry and to really bring in you know, some kind of uh, spiritual, intellectual, uh, esoteric component. And I have been talking with a lot of younger, fresh Masons, so to speak. Uh, they come to masonry because they are told or they read that this is something unique. It's not like the other social clubs. It's not like a simple dining club. It Because we have a ritual which is unique to our craft, because we have certain teachings that should be handed over and uh, during the mentoring process. And when they don't find that, because most of the lodges don't provide this, uh, they don't provide for these expectations, then they leave. So maybe one of the reasons that we have with the retention, because we 
don't lack candidates or uh, uh, applicants, we have an issue with the retention. Um, maybe it's time to think that maybe we don't provide what they are coming for. And so to look into this, I'll just give you an example. In North America, most people never heard about the Chamber of Reflection, which is a big deal everywhere else in the world. And it has a, a very, very important role. I went through it, and I can tell you, even though I don't remember one word from my initiation ceremony, I remember sitting in the Chamber of Reflection alone, uh, being invited to write my Masonic Testament and left there for about half hour to think about this big step that I'm going to take, which might define, uh, in a way or other, uh, the rest of my life. And it was a very profound experience. I remember it very vividly, even after 30 years. It was 30 years now in January that I was initiated. And that was probably one of the most... Uh, uh, most important experiences I went through. There was also the initiation had a few moments, but I don't want to talk about it because that's uh, uh, not for uh, profane years. Anyway, so as a master of my, my lodge in Hamilton, one of my first actions was I invited a brother to do a presentation. He has a mobile presentation with a little table and the objects that are placed in the chamber of reflection and explaining the meaning of them and explaining the role and explaining the whole idea of this chamber. And then a relatively fresh mason from my lodge came up to me and said, you know, before I apply to the lodge, I read a lot about this and about the chamber of reflection and I was waiting when in the process of initiation will it happen? Because I was so prepared to, to have this experience. Instead, we put him in a small room where the janitor keeps uh, his uh, mops and stuff. Okay, change. And that's it. And that that's not to elevate your soul, to prepare your soul and mind to be initiated in an order like ours. You know, there's there's a lot there that that you said, going back kind of to, to the start, right? That's another, I mentioned earlier, there's there's two, or I said that you, you're getting kind of two questions a lot. What is, what makes a good Freemason? The exoteric versus esoteric kind of enterprise of Freemasonry. You brought up another question that seems to be coming up a lot, which is, can Freemasonry grow too big? Can it grow too big too fast? Is there a point, you know, should the should the emphasis be on more members or should the emphasis be on a, a focusing on the membership that you have and trying to mentor those and not necessarily growing too big, which is in and of itself a super fascinating debate. I think most most grand lodges seem to be erring towards fewer towards uh, instead of trying to just focus on getting your numbers up, trying to focus on slowing down and actually making the the application process not harder but longer. Right, there are a lot of of, of grand lodges now, which are encouraging, um, I think, uh, I can't think of the jurisdiction now, but one, one jurisdiction has a requirement that after a, somebody puts in their application, before you can have a ballot, before you can have an investigation committee, that applicant has to attend at least three social functions to get to meet other lodge members and, and things of that nature, right? So you're definitely seeing kind of a desire from the Grand Lodge perspective, a lot of Grand Lodges, to put the brakes on on things. Sometimes it's a requirement. Sometimes it's just encouraged, 
right? Um, we also have I that think. recommendation from the Grand yeah. Lodge, the document, the five steps uh, to the application, uh, which uh, it's a recommendation for the lodges to follow. So not to hand out an application immediately when somebody knocks on the door. But uh, before that, try to know the that person and see if it fits in Freemasonry and this lodge in particular. And very rarely I heard that somebody, some lodge may say that, oh, that other lodge would be a, a better fit for you. Go and, and give your application there. Because... Uh, Honestly, uh, I don't think that there are two big differences uh, between our, our lodges. They are all the same cut, uh, so to speak, and uh, that we don't have affinity lodges, uh, which is very common in uh, England, that people being interested in the same things like soccer or music or uh, performing art or, or whatever, and they are in the same lodge. Uh, I heard that there used to be a lodge in Hamilton, which was predominantly policeman, but not anymore. So, yeah, maybe we, we, there are a lot of things that we should start thinking about, discussing openly uh, and honestly, and uh, trying to to move the the craft and everything we do in the direction that would be a more fulfilling more rewarding um activity or or participation i don't know i am as i said i don't really have many answers but i have a lot of questions all the time we are, i think that's I think there's nothing wrong with that right um I think if more people just ask more questions, right? The Socratic method. Um, you, you also talked about retention, which is its own. I think retention is probably, well, first, how do you define retention, right? What would you define as, as, as uh, yeah, how, how would you define retention? If after initiation, passing, and raising, they are still around, and after 10 years, they are still a, how to say, a prominent member, and the, the core of the lodge that are showing up regularly to work, then you don't have a retention problem. If after initiation, the guy disappeared and you never seen him, seen him that might be a problem with retention because yes he came he paid his initiation fee and the dues for the first year and then never returned why there must be a reason there must be a reason either we did something wrong or we didn't do something right uh, because uh, or and more and more I am inclined lately to, to see this also as a reason. The initial discussion before even handing him an application, all those discussions about time involvement, financial involvement, uh, and everything else that means, you know, the, the learning process and all that stuff, we don't give them a clear picture. Uh, bluntly, we lie a lot. One night a month. That's, come on, we all know that it's not true. It's not one night, and uh, it it is way more involved. Uh, if at that point in his life, having family issues, small kids, uh, very busy job, nothing wrong, advising him, we like you, we would love you to have in the lodge, maybe in a couple of years or so, your life will change, You will, it will be easier, why don't you return, we will be waiting for you with open arms. Never heard that to be said. 
which is bad because yes he is busy well didn't you talk with him before he even was uh balloted or or sending out the the investigation thing committee it's a huge responsibility people take it very lightly that oh we go there and we have a coffee papa after that we sit down sign the paper yeah he's a good guy that's it what did you discuss with him with, uh, beside the last week's uh, football game? Nothing. Nothing important. And uh, again, it should be that all the members go individually and spend a couple of hours with the applicant to know him. That committee is the ears and the eyes of the worship master and the lodge. Last time we were sending out a committee, I said, Think about this. Based on your decision, your recommendation, you will have to sit with guy until you die or he dies in the lodge. You will have to sit together with him. So that's how seriously you should take your recommendation and, and your uh, report about that person. Um, we fail most of the time. It, it became a formality. Empty formality as so many things in our craft. Yeah, yeah I, <laughs> I think the, you know, I appreciated your definition of retention because I think that that in and of itself is a challenge uh, to define well, right? Because I think by and large, um, retention is usually defined as just the number of dues paying members you have year upon year or life members right so if i if a, if a if a candidate is initiated in 1987 and you know he pays his dues every year um up to to 2024 but he's never been seen in lodge right the the average lodge, the average grand lodge will consider that as a retained member. And then they'll create a, a distinction kind of one level down as to whether he's an active member or an inactive member. And then you kind of have these um, you know, splitting of hairs. You know, I suppose financially, the lodge may, there may be a value in that distinction because whether he's showing up or not, if he's paying his dues, that goes to making sure the lodge is financially viable, um, which is one of the arguments you often hear as to, you know, the value of a of an empty apron, right? I call it, or like a, the value of a name on a piece of paper is that so long as your dues adequately reflect the cost of running your lodge, then every member, whether they're there or not, is kind of a kind of a necessity to keep the lodge running. Um, in my experience, though. Um, kind of most most lodges the issue is not financial not that there aren't lodges with financial issues but most lodges what kills them quicker than financial challenges is the ability to fill a lodge room or fill officer chairs or get a sufficient number of people to do the work necessary to run the lodge um, tends to be in my opinion far more of a challenge than the bank account right um but yeah, so that does tend to be, I think, the challenge with the idea of retention, right? What, it, right? And and to what extent? And that brings up a whole other set of questions, right? Like, why is that brother paying his dues, right? Which is something because it's not... too cheap. Well, but even if it's too cheap, I mean, especially because we don't have the Netflix quote unquote Netflix model, right? So I can understand and I've done this and everybody I know has done this, right? You sign up for something um, and you just click on the automatic payment button online. So every year, every month, every whatever it is, every six months, the, the money for that subscription is automatically taken from your account. So it's like, and I call it the Netflix approach, right? Netflix is relying on this idea of like, that's why they have free trials, lower trials. It's like you sign up for it, you forget about it. It's only, say, $10 a month. So you forget to click that button that says, I'm going to stop paying, and you just have this thing forever. 
you know, if if Freemasonry was such that, I mean, and I'm sure there might be some lodges that do it, but where it was just automatic payments to the secretary every year, then I could understand, yes, it's cheap, so guys just aren't paying attention, they forget. But, you know, most mo most times you still have to take the 10 minutes to write a check, mail it in, like you still have, it has to be enough on your mind that you, you do it. So it's like, what is, what is it about Freemasonry that is getting these people who aren't showing up to lodge, never show up to lodge, maybe for years, especially if they live in the area, they haven't moved. You I know, have an some... analogy for that as well. Uh, most people don't like it, but I will tell you anyway. So let's say that you take out a membership in a golf club for $100 per year. Now, whether you go to golf for that or not, well, it's only $100. doesn't matter. I don't go this week. I will go maybe next week. Ah, maybe next month. Now, if you paid $50,000 for a membership, you would take every opportunity to go and use it and be present and, and be active in that club. So, uh, that back to what I was saying, that we sell too cheap. Because when I joined here uh, in two, around 2000, my stepmother lodge, as I call it, the electric, um, the dues were 35 Canadian dollars. Now, I was coming from a poor post-communist uh, uh, half uh, uh, country with a destroyed economy and my dues over there were way, way more than here. And uh, so I, I thought it was a joke because they didn't increase the dues since the, before the war, I guess. It used to be in normal places, and that's how it was even in Canada and uh, and U.S., the whole North America. It used to be around one week's wages. That was the yearly due. Now, if you would want to ask that much, everybody would. Last year, they were upset about $10 more. And so I it's just... A bunch of cheap people that I don't do. They are members. They are not Masons. So I think that's a, another one of those questions, right? Do raise them, lower them. That pops up all the time. Keep them the same. You know, I think putting that aside, right? I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of why these these people keep paying their dues. It's this idea of. I can go next week, right? Like, um, the, so w if, if you're a member of a gym, it's the same idea, right? Having that membership, it's, it's, it's a, you can, you can kind of lie to yourself basically. And, and I haven't gone the last year, but I'll go next, I'll go next week. I'll go next week. Right. And I think that's the difference between that and say, going back to the analogy of Netflix, right. With, most people, when it's a small enough number and it's automatically taken from their bank account, they just forget that they have it, right? And you go back and you look and you say, oh, I've, I've, I forgot I signed up for Netflix or whatever it is, right? It's not, you're not thinking about it. With, I think, Freemasonry, with the gym, with something like that, especially where you're, it's not automatically deducted, but you have to take the effort to, if nothing else, send in a check or an e-transfer, it's more your you're telling yourself that you're going to attend, but you're there's, there's always something that pops up. There's always an excuse to not, right. There's always a reason at the day of to, to not do it. And I think, I mean, I've, I've had, I've had different opinions on how to, to deal with that, which I tried to get through in the past, but I do think that that's one of the, the main issues, right? It's so easy to fool yourself into saying, I can always go next week. I can always go next week. And and I brought this up to a brother not that long ago because he he had not attended Lodge for, I think, 28 years, something like that. Um, and he had said that, um, you know, I, I, I always know that I could, you know, I always knew I could come back. 
And I said, how do you know? I said, you know, you say that. I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll bring you back. We'll welcome you back. But how do you know the lodge will still be available for you to come back to? So the amount of work it takes to run a lodge and to get quorum and to get the members and to, you know, I said, it's, you don't always know that the lodge is going to be around. So I think anybody who kind of takes for granted this idea that I can always return to lodge next week needs to understand that uh, there might not be that many weeks left if the lodge is struggling to get enough people to get a quorum and to get officers and to run the business of the lodge. Right. So that's yeah, something yeah. that, yes, something that brothers need to keep in mind. Um, yeah, so what was your, going back to your book, Weekly Masonic Doubts, what was your, your hope in writing it? What is your hope for the brothers who read it? Do you want them to bring it to Lodge, maybe get discussions started, use it as a, a jumping off point to start with presentations? Kind of what are your hopes when it comes to the, the, this really, really well written and, and fun piece of work? You know, whenever you write a book or sometimes even just an article, you always have in mind a potential virtual reader, so to speak, and, and you try to talk to, to that person or to write to that person as if it was a one-on-one uh, -on -one discussion. And uh, in this book, I the reason it has 52 uh, chapters or articles, mini essays, whatever you want to call them. Uh, my idea, as I described in the introduction, to read one of those a week and contemplate, think, ponder, think about it for about a week and try to find your own answers to the questions raised in, in that piece. Uh, try to if you are so inclined, try to find uh, more reading related to that, uh, even if there is no uh, footnote or endnote to that peculiar uh, piece. So that was the main idea, to, to, to give food for thought, so to speak, for a whole year, if you follow through uh, by the weekly readings. Now, to my uh, very pleasant surprise, I got feedback from different places uh, from Ontario and from Europe that, oh, I presented one piece in Open Lodge and they like it was a lively discussion after that and they, they want to continue and they asked the person to present in the following months more pieces from my book as a starting point for a Masonic education discussion. I think I, I couldn't have asked for anything better and anything greater than such feedback, you know, that it seems that it touched some lodges, some members, uh, the, the things that I was telling and writing in this book, and they they want to hear more and they are willing to sit down and discuss and that's already without me it the book goes on its own life so to speak so the, those pieces live there it they provide a starting point for discussions for the brothers there and i think uh, that's the 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 biggest thing that could happen uh, when I got these feedbacks, you know, I, I was really, really flattered. I said, well, maybe, maybe this is, it was worth doing it. If I could touch even one lodge or two or, or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's not about the numbers. It's about starting a qualitative uh, change, maybe. Now that's... I think, yeah, I think that, that's all you can hope to do, right? You, you you start with one and it kind of snowballs from there. Or you hope it snowballs from there. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, yeah, I, I like I like the idea of it being, you said it's it's a, a week, you know, one time per week. You know, most lodges, 
will meet once a month, twice a month if you want to count degrees. So, I mean, that gives you, you know, four four chance, four different topics that you can decide on what you want to bring to Lodge uh, every month, right? And you can assign d different questions. And, and again, the, the beautiful thing about that is it leaves it open to the membership to decide what they want to talk about and what side they fit on. I'm sure there's going to be, and I would hope, right, that there's going to be some disagreements in a Lodge on some of these questions and what the answer sure. is, which would definitely, that I think, you know, if nothing else, Freemasonry should hopefully teach us how to be able to disagree respectfully, which is not always easy, um, myself included. But I, so yeah, so I, I, I think that that is, is, it's a great thing to see instead of somebody offering the answers to Masons, just offering at the very least the right questions to ask, which I think is a good starting place. Do you think, um, so you, you mentioned Europe, like how far has this book traveled? Because um, I mean, obviously it's traveled pretty far in Ontario, but beyond that, you mentioned, you know, getting, con having conversations from Europe, having conversations. So is this book making its way through the States, through Europe? Like, like how many, how far have you been shipping this out and, and what's the response been like globally? Well, um, I am shipping out only uh, signed copies if somebody uh, contacts me personally through email, Facebook, uh, Twitter, whatever, and then I can ship them a signed copy. Uh, other than that, they can buy uh, from Amazon to almost any um, online outlet. They can order both the paper version of it or the it, there is also an ebook version for those that like to to have it on their phone or on their Kindle or Kobo or whichever uh, device they use it. So it can be ordered uh, from uh, many outlets, uh, and I am also, especially here in driving distance. I am always willing to uh, honor any invitation by lodges to go there to make a presentation, to talk about the book, and eventually uh, offering a discounted uh, price and sign at the, at the end of the lodge. Uh, I had been already to several lodges, and uh, I just finalized today another invitation early next month and uh, yeah it it's a great um, experience to have this kind of feedback you know from uh, knowledgeable brothers uh, appreciating uh, what i wrote and wanting to wanting me to present to their lodge and and to offer an opportunity to have a live discussion with the author and eventually to interact uh, along the ideas of the book. Um, I think, of course, like any author, I would like to sell a million uh, copies. It won't happen <laughs> ever. I am aware of that. Uh, but uh, I would rather have it uh, bought and read by people who are um, genuinely interested because just buying it and put on the shelf somewhere you know and never touch it that defines the whole purpose uh why i wrote it so i am uh moderately happy with the uh, outreach uh, how far the book traveled i had I have lots of readers in the United States, in Canada, and as I said, from Greece to Hungary and from England to um, Scotland and, and who knows where. Uh, I, I don't follow uh, because I cannot really uh, know exactly all the buyers, but I, I know that it has, it had, you know, now quite a wide uh, reach and hopefully it won't stop here although i am working maybe 
on another one, at least uh, thinking about another book. But for now, let this run its uh, course. <laughs> I think... I think your book ties into this kind of what you've talked about tied into this. So I'm curious, I don't know uh, kind of what will end here. I don't know if you've um, heard this expression before. I, I've, I've been hearing it a lot over the last couple of years, most recently re regarding an event that took place in Alberta this last weekend, a uh, weekend without titles, it was called uh, Matt Parker spoke there. I heard um, about it. Yeah. yeah uh, the idea that we're, in a Masonic um, renaissance, especially kind of post-COVID. I'm not sure if you've heard that expression before, but just off the top of your your head, you know, do you think that we might be in some type of Masonic renaissance right now? And what does that, that mean to you? Because I think, you know, if we consider kind of some of the, the ideas behind the renaissance and what it meant, I think books like yours would certainly tie into this idea of being in a, in a Masonic renaissance. Um, and kind of the increased increased philosophical discussions and questioning and examinations of the craft may maybe fit into that renaissance a little bit, in which case we make you one of the drivers of the Masonic renaissance. Yeah, I didn't think exactly this term. I know uh, what it means. And uh, if I am overly optimistic, I would say that maybe, maybe there is something uh, starting. Maybe there is a need and uh, hopefully there might be a push from the younger brothers who require and are longing for this kind of renewal in Freemasonry. And if uh, ourselves... I mean, myself, the older generation, uh, can be, you know, even a little bit part of it or contribute uh, something to it that would make me proud. Now, probably there is a slowly emerging trend because of the, there is a, a demand for change and for a more profound experience in masonry. And I will just refer that, I don't know if you heard about it, in Ontario we will have the first Masonic Con in Burlington on May the 4th, uh, where a lot of prominent uh, masons, big, Grandmaster, Deputy Grandmaster, Past Grandmasters, and uh, and scholars and uh, Masons from U.S. and Ontario will be presenting, and it will be done in the Royal Botanical Garden in Burlington, where there is a path of kind of meditation and contemplation, and the. That's how it will be built around that. Uh, and it's all about Masonic enlightenment. That's the, the main idea, the main topic of it. And I think uh, that's also a sign that uh, if there is a need, we have to cater and we have to organize and get together real like-minded man, because we often use that uh, phrase without thinking that, are we really like-minded? But in lucky cases, like this discussion, like-minded man could meet and, and have a meaningful discussion. And that's, uh, that's what we are lacking many times, you know, just sit down and have a meaningful discussion about our purpose, our aims, uh, our values, and and find the people around you that think the same way and go from there together. Yeah, and I think I think that that is right. I've, I've, I actually want to do a podcast with the Masonic um, 
Burlington MasonicCon guys, I got to send them an email because I think it's great to have a MasonicCon in Ontario. And so I'm really hoping that um, I'm hoping to get in touch with those guys. And I don't know if I can make it or not. I think something goes up that weekend. But I mean, yeah, kudos to them. Kudos to having it. And I think you're absolutely right. I think we're, we're definitely in an age of, in my opinion, Masonic enlightenment. I don't know if I would quite use the term Renaissance myself, but I definitely think we're in, a, in an age of Masonic enlightenment. I think the next goal has to be to be in an age of Masonic relevance. I think that's what we're missing now, um, which we've got to work on, right? Um, but that's, a, that's a, a whole other hour-long discussion, I think. Um, but that's kind of what where I think this conversation needs to switch more, right? How, how relevant is Freemasonry to the communities in which it's located and to the membership therein. And I think that's the thing we need to work on. Having said that, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for the signed copy. I got my book here. I think it's a, it's, it's an awesome, awesome book. Um, I loved especially the part, um, the, 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 section on ritual i thought that was really well done um and i think that that's something i've been thinking about a lot i like the part about um the the touching on the retention issue why are masons joining and not returning and i like the way you define retention um but everybody should check out a copy of this book every I mean, everybody should, but especially Masons, right? I mean, that's who it's written for. That's the purpose behind it. So get a copy of it. Book uh, Brother Horvat, uh, Worshipful Brother Horvat, if you can, to come to your lodge and talk about it. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me and for the appreciative words about my book. Uh, thank you. It was a pleasure to have this discussion. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. I never say this, so I'm going to say it. Like, comment, subscribe, blah, blah, all the things you're supposed to do to help a podcast reach and get out there. Um, and yeah, Masonic Con people in Burlington, I'm going to get in touch with you guys at some point because I'm hoping to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much. And I will talk to you again soon, sir. Have a good day. Have a good day.